Yo, 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 what's up all you burner stoners and potheads? This is Weedman420 with the Weedman420 Chronicles. How are all you v -v 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 vipers doing out there? Mrs. Weedman. Mr. Weedman. How the hell are you? Fantastic. I love it when you're fan-fucking-tastic. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'm doing great. And hopefully everybody out there in the world is smoking some big fat doinks right to listen to the show. And we're about to get normal. And we're smoking some acai grown by our good friend, Big Earl. And Mrs. Weedman's going to light that up. Don't yeah. have any information on this one, just that I know it gets me very baked. And it is very good. It was very purpley nerpley buds. Smell is fantastic. The high is just woo. So we'll see how this show goes today after we light Mrs. Weedman lights that. Is this Big Earl's genetics? Uh, well, he's he crossbred it and uh -huh. stuff, so... Um, but yeah, it's fantastic. So, uh, we smoked a lot of this. So, and, uh, we're smoking it out of a real spliff society, palm leaf. The uh, best. Yeah. Really personal good. Personal favorite. Yeah. Personal favorite of the show. That's for sure. So thanks Briggs over at the real spliff society. We appreciate you throwing us packs every time we see you. We love them and everybody who we give them to loves them. So check out the real spliff society cause he's a real good dude and got some good people working for him over there and his man, if, if you never tried them before. I don't know if, if you know what a punk is. A punk, back when I was a kid, we'd go to the swamp, and the punks were like the big, long grass, and they would grow these punks coming out of them. They were brown. They were pussy willows. No, they're not pussy willows. I know willows. what you're talking about, those they're brown, the punks. big brown they're things. They're called punks. Mm -hmm. You have a pussy willow out in front of the house. No, that's just a willow. <laughs> There's a lot of varieties of pussy willows. This is a punk. Yeah, pussy and we willow. Call <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's just fun to say. <laughs> For someone who doesn't like to say the word pussy, mm. willow. Pussy yeah. willow. <laughs> <laughs> so we are, Miss Weaver got me thrown off check talking about the P word here. <laughs> so, but it, 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 if you ever had one, we would go to the swamp, we'd cut a bunch of them and dry them for 4th of July, and then we'd use them to light fireworks up, and they gave this distinct smell that I always loved as a kid. And it's the same thing they use for incense. When uh, uh, you go to an incense store and you buy the long, those are punks. Right. And uh, and this smells so nice when you, when you light it up. It smells like a punk. And uh, not calling anybody out there a punk. This is the... the, the, hey, the punk. Yeah. <laughs> so, don't, don't be a punk, you uh, pussy willow. But so many people we've given this to have tried it. They love it. And and we just see Briggs all the time at, at events we go to, and he always throws us a few packs. So I always tell him to throw him a shout-out. So thanks, the Real Spliff Society, for these uh, great uh, great palm wraps. They're amazing. So uh, we had a, a great weekend. We got to go to an event at uh, called Nikan. It was up in, in Schaumburg, and I'd like to give a shout-out to our friend Sam, who met up with us and gave us some tincture. It was amazing, by the way. Thanks, yes, Sam. Appreciate thanks, Sam. you. And uh, we got to meet some dope people, and we got to meet some people we already know in the industry, and we got to see some meet some new friends. And uh, who did we meet that we took a picture with? We uh, saw Mickey. Mickey. That's it. He's just a guy you need to know. Yeah, a guy you need to know. That's how he explained himself. <laughs> I'm just a guy you need to know. Mickey's You're always supporting us. You're hogging us. that joint, by I'm the sorry, way. I'm sorry, I'm not done yet. <laughs> you smoked I'll, like six you'll have it in a minute. It's puff, puff, there's, pass. There's plenty for you. <laughs> <laughs> so Mickey is a guy you need to know, or a person you need to know. And uh, so we got to take a great picture with him. We got to see people from uh, The Real Split Society, Vape and Prop, uh, Windy High City, Focus Media, High Focus Media, Legacy uh, Cannabis, Legacy Cannabis, uh, a bunch of breeders bunch were there. Of breeders. Uh, we got to meet a, a bunch of good people and got to go around tables. Met and say a nice hello. guy that moved here. Where did he move here from? Ohio. Ohio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris, he was a good dude. He was a farmer. Farmer. Long yeah. Long time farmer. Yeah, home grower. But you know, and uh, he was really dope. And we were talking about nutrients because uh, I had some nutrients I was giving Sam that I got from Big Earl. And uh, we talked for about like 30 minutes with him while we were waiting for Sam to show up. So it was great talking to him. But the event was really nice. We got to see a, uh, a talk about uh, Illinois consumption lounges yes. and, and, and what people need to do to get Illinois to a start like, allowing them, which was really cool to see. Um, who else? What else did we do there? Yeah, there was a panel discussing all the the ins and outs and all the the mysteries of of having consumption spaces because people want to be able to consume not have to go home not right. have to hide in their car people want to be able to consume in a safe place, place in a safe place enjoyable place yeah and socially in a 
you know, a place like you would go socially have drinks. People want consumption lounges. So it was a really interesting panel. These were people who were experienced at doing so in other states. They were somewhat familiar with Illinois law. There was a uh, mediator or a moderator who um, kept the flow going, of course. That's the, her position there. But also knew she knew the Illinois laws. So she would pose questions that would... Um, strike up the conversation. It was a good panel. Um, who else do we see? We saw uh, Patrick from Couch Locked, another yeah. pod, oh, another awesome. podcast. Yeah, he's a, such a nice guy. Yeah, shout yeah. out so to Patrick. We saw some great, some great people. Lots of breeders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Lots of light companies and different types of companies there. CBD companies. Yeah, it was good. You actually, we met a fun guy. I think his name. I don't remember his name. He had the puzzle pieces. Yeah, he was sweet. He was very nice. Yeah. Yeah, his wife just passed away. He was telling us. He made he. It was actually quite cool. It was cannabis artwork. He doesn't just do cannabis artwork, but obviously for the convention, he brought all of his cannabis pieces. But they visualize a a black frame with a black mat, and then on it a three dimensional. Um, laser cut cannabis leaf with a graphic on it of whether it's the variety of cannabis that you like or a tie dye print or some words he can customize them to fit. And then he also made them into puzzles. We'll have to figure out. I've got his card. It's upstairs. He had really high quality product. Yeah, it was, was nice. pretty cool. And he was really nice. And he had like checkerboards and stuff that had like that uh, cannabis leaves. Yeah, it was kind of cool. It was fun. Yeah, it was, yeah. it was neat. So it was a good event. It was, it was fun. fun. It was quick. We were only in there for a two or three hours and yeah. stuff. It wasn't a huge event. So compared to the event we're going to this week, and that's mm -hmm. Champ's trade show. We saw show. Vape and Prop, too. Yeah, I gave him a shout out. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah, we saw Vape and Prop. Uh, but uh, we are going to Champ's trade show yeah, this week. Yeah, this which is, is a big one. Yeah, this is the trade show that it's all like vendors who sell glass, cannabis accessories, on and on and on and on and on. It's huge. The one in Vegas, I think, is bigger, but this one's going to be pretty big. This well, Champs is for business owners only. Yes. This is a wholesaling show. Yes. So it's pretty cool. It's just if you have a smoke shop, if you have a dispensary, you're going to this to find your goods to put in your shop yeah. or your whatever. It's it's for people in the biz. Yeah. We were told to go. Yeah. We, this we've is heard be by a big three one. or four people like, if you haven't been to a Champs trade show yet, you need to go there. Yeah. Because everybody like 300, and anybody. 300 vendors. Yeah. Or shows, everybody and anybody or... go there. Yeah. So, and big. that's in the industry, like in the accessory business. And so we're super stoked to go. And then we have, what are we going to? There's a lot of CBD companies too. Is there? And, and, uh, uh, extraction companies, gotcha. services, lab companies. There's, a quite a, a variety of marketing companies. The Vegas one I heard is huge, huge. but uh, we'll, make it, we'll make it there one one time. Yeah. But what are we going to this week, too? We're going and then to... we've got two cannabis social events. Yeah. One is for people in the biz, but kind of in a general sense. If you consider yourself in the biz, go. And then the other one is we're... Okay, so that is called... Um, i got to look at the name. Elevated Connections. So that's going to be happening if you have access to Event High, Event HI. It's part of Eventbrite, and it's a newer platform for cannabis uh, um, events. Uh, not everybody uses it, but you can find some things on there. So this is hosted by actually High Focus Media, the girls uh, that were on the media group that was on for our 420, 420. show. Yep. Uh, they're uh, co-hosting this. And it is a networking uh, event for plant medicine professionals at the Node in Chicago. So look it up. That's on June 7th. So actually, by the time you hear this episode, it'll already have happened. Yeah. So next time around, we'll give you more notice. Um, and then on Sunday, we're going to... Brunch, Brunch of, of Stoners. So stoked. So always a good time. Always a good time at Brunch of Stoners. If you haven't gotten to one yet, it's a good time. You get fed very well. You smoke a lot of weed. Mm -hmm. You uh, get to meet a lot of cool people. Yep. Uh, swag, it's swag, food, food snacks, mocktails, games, games. Mocktails. Yeah. Are they doing it at the same place this time? No. No. Well, Damn, I don't that, know. That venue was dope. The address wasn't released. But gotcha. I think they said at this one, smoking outside, consumption is all outdoor and then indoor, no consumption. Although the last one was kind of that way. It was indoor, outdoor. Indoor, outdoor. The last one, so yeah. So I don't know. We'll see when we get there. It was great. Brunch, if you have not gone to a brunch of stoners and tried their Pop-Tarts, you're missing out. <laughs> oh, crybaby sweets. <laughs> this is like becoming one big commercial here, but we really have had a productive week of 
uh, having canvas fun. business. Having fun. fun. Just going, yeah. socializing. Meeting people. Yeah, and, yeah, that's what it's all about, the community it's and fun. talking with people and having fun and just going out and doing events. Everyone and, doing their thing. Yeah, it's good. It's good. We're not throwing any commercials out there. We're just giving people plugs because we appreciate right, what the right. hard work they're doing and stuff. But so. Cry Baby Sweets, you, you uh, go to town on their Pop-Tarts. Pop-Tarts. Mm-hmm. So good. They Actually, good. everything they do is so good, but the Pop-Tarts are, are – I'm a fan favorite. Last time they had <laughs> acai bowls. I did not do I it. I really won't. It looked like those. it looked like chocolate pudding. Oh no, they were so good. I know you, you guys all so ate good. them, but I was like, nope, I'm good. I just want <laughs> pop tarts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you ready to get the show started? Let's do it. Let's do this. What is the problem with cannabis packaging? From my perspective, I'll give you one word, maybe two, p- three. Pain in the ass to open. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's and five words. <laughs> too much to dispose of. Yes. So that is big problem. So let's go into it. Cannabis packaging laws are extensive. Yes, blame a lot of it on the states, of course. Like all cannabis regulations vary by state, regulators create these laws with public safety in mind, some of which, like ensuring packaging is child-resistant, are common in every state. But these same regulations can cause issues for consumers navigating a dispensary product menu. I've had somebody send me a picture one time of a tin they tried to open up, and they pounded it with a hammer and tried to open it with pliers, and they still couldn't get it open. I remember. I remember showing it to me. They had, like, needle nose pliers yeah. trying to, like, break it. And then he just yeah. decided to smash it with a hammer. And, and then he threw it, it out because he smashed he all like, the gummies it. inside. <laughs> he was so frustrated. <laughs> Others with compromised immune systems could be at risk buying flour with labels lacking relevant information. These cannabis packaging issues plague the cannabis industry in multiple states. Many companies packaging package their flour, edibles, and sometimes extract containers in sealed Mylar bags. A consumer must open Mylar bags, which I will tell you is a pain in the ass sometimes. I've had trouble opening up my other bags. You can't get your fucking fingers in there to open up the seam. Drives me nuts. Uh, you got to rip off the top, grasping the corners and pulling. It wasn't until uh, this per- this journalist was butt tending and met a patient with rheum- rheumatoid arthritis in her hands that I realized what a challenge this type of packaging could be for those with limited hand mobility. So, I- so before I go any further, is there childproof locks on alcohol? No. <laughs> I'll move on. Ripping off mm. the seal is difficult when when my hu- hands are numb and it's hard to reopen the package. Pushing down and spinning the lid off a child resistant jar can also be difficult during a flare up. That's why you get your your packaging of weed at home and you put it into a better jar. A better jar. A better jar. Like an eight decades jar? There you go. <laughs> now that's a commercial. I, it took me a minute. I was now, a little slow. I'm like, oh, I think he wants me to plug. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a commercial. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Yeah. Uh, I approve of child-resistant packaging, but it is painfully ironic that patients seeking cannabis to alleviate symptoms from conditions like rheumatoid arthritis cannot access the products because the packaging inflames their condition. I, I even have problems sometimes opening up some of this packaging. So in Washington state, producers do not have to label packaging with legal pesticides used to grow the product. Labels are barred from including false or misleading information, depicting or appealing to children, making claims about therapeutic effects, or promoting overconsumption. Washington brands must rely uh, relay the cannabinoid content and the producer license number on labels. And in the case of edibles, the milligram amount included in the package per dose. Due to the lack of regulatory oversight, companies often opt to solely include cannabinoid content and strain names on their packaging, omitting legal pesticides or other cultivation methods relevant to conscious consumers or immune-compromised medical patients. The law does dictate that retail dispensaries must have a testing certificate of analysis, or COA, a detailed list of verified results from certified cannabis testing labs available for consumers who ask, but many don't know they are available or don't know how to read a COA. This example in Washington is one drop in the bucket of cannabis product labeling in the U.S. where pesticides-related issues like product recalls plague cannabis commerce. It makes me quite sad to see joint tubes and Mylar bags littering the streets of my seaside Washington town. This is the writer. But that is what I've witnessed since moving to Seattle in 2017. Regulations uh, necessity over packaged products. One container could be additional bags or boxes to meet regulations about opacity or children resistance. And many of the containers end up in landfills. 
When I was a bud tender a medical at a medical dispensary, there weren't a lot of consumer packaged goods outside of a single serve edibles, and patients were allowed to bring in a jar that we would fill with flowers. This model could reduce packaging waste, now seen in adult use states like California and Illinois, but retail dispensaries cannot wholesale flour by the pound. In Oregon, bud tenders still weigh flour for adult use customers rather than sell packaged grams, eights, and quarters. I've been to Oregon. I've been to Washington. Mm-hmm. I'm here in Illinois. I, I've been to, I've been to a lot of states with a lot of dispensaries. In in Oregon, and and I went to Electric Lettuce, and they weigh it out for you, but they put it in a plastic container with a, with a snap sealed lock. But what they do also do is you bring your container back, and they have uh, recycle bins That's in good. the stores. That was that Electric Lettuce. Yes, very good. But still, if you just sell them a jar. A glass jar mm-hmm. that seals, right? You know, like the yep. ceiling around it, or a, a twist that seals. They can bring that jar back in and out, and you just hand them the label that has all the all the uh, requirements that a label has, right? And you just give it to them. Pretty simple. Yeah, pretty simple. So they can just keep on bringing in and out the same jar. Some states like Vermont have addressed the issue at the inception of adult use regulation. For example, the first general rule for cannabis packaging in Vermont is that it is reusable and not made of plastic. Good for you. Good for you, Vermont. In response, Vermont brands use jars instead of Mylar bags and other wasteful options. Great. Though it feels bleak looking at uh, at a wall of Mylar bags at dispensaries after washing and reusing a Ziploc bag at home for the fourth time, some companies are developing sustainable options. Uh, this packaging company is making products from hemp-based plastics. Great. Should be. Everybody in the cannabis industry should be using hemp-based plastic. Reclaimed ocean-bound plastic. Great. And other innovative materials. While companies uh, like um, th- this one company, packaging wholesale uh, compliant compostable bags. Great. They are sustainable cannabis packaging od- options but with high taxes and a race to the lowest price per unit. Many cannabis companies can't afford the cost. I understand. That is a huge thing, too, because you ha- it does cost a lot of money for packaging. So if we can make packaging cheaper, I don't understand why recycled plastic is more expensive. It drives me crazy. It should be cheaper. It's already been used once, and I know the processes must be more expensive to do it, but it should be able to come down. Uh, while cannabis uh, regulations differ by state, the problems don't. Many consumers navigate child-resistant packaging that may be hard to open. If you have low hand mobility and many people don't know how to read a COA, additionally increased waste from cannabis products continues to plague the industry. Those states are dealing with the same issue. There is no one solution, but awareness is the start. So what we need to do is... I, I like the article a lot, but we've talked about recycled. We've talked about cannabis packaging before, oh, yeah. but what really needs to happen is they really need to get a grip on letting people use glass jars and bringing that back in. I think everywhere should be deli style because you, I would want to every state like Michigan deli style. Uh, Oregon was deli style. There's a lot of states that do deli style. If you know what deli style is, it's when you go to the, and they have the cannabis in big containers on the wall or in big jars, and they bring it to you and they put it. You can look at it. They put it like in a little dish before they weigh it, and they let you look at the bud, and then they transfer it into packaging. If you were able to bring your own jar, give it to him. Here you go. Do do do. Weigh it out. Put it in. Close the jar up. Give you the receipt. Give you the the the, the receipt that has all the information on there and your receipt that you paid. And you walk out. It's not that hard. You know. Gotcha. It should be done. Anyway, how do you get the most out of your vape cart? We we vape. We do we do use vaporizers. You vape, we, bro. I do vape, bro. And uh, they have their convenience. Do we do it a lot? No. But we do do when we're out, you know, going to, going to a bar or going to dinner. We, we'll hit the vape on the way. If we're not, we don't have a joint on us or something like that. They have their purpose. I do like them they, for... They're good to keep bedside table yeah. if you can't sleep during right. the night. And you don't want to run hit. down and, yeah. and, and light a bowl or anything like that or light a joint up. So, yes, they have their place. I do like them. So how do you get the most out of it, though? Whew. All right. If you want to know, you want to know. It is a allergy-heavy day for me. My nose is stuffy from the weed, too. So, here we go. 
Cannabis vape cartridges have become increasingly popular over the years. A quick and convenient way to consume, vape carts now account for more than 23% of overall cannabis sales in the U.S. The system may be exceedingly simple. Screw the cartridge onto a 510 thread battery, press the button, and inhale. But issues can arise. Nothing is worse than spending your hard-earned cash on a cart and having it fail you. So here are six ways to get the most from your vape cart. These tips and tricks will ensure your vaping experience is all it can be. Go low, go slow. One of the biggest mistakes people make when using a vape cart is pulling or inhaling too hard. These devices can be tricky since you do not always know how big of a hit you're going to get while in motion. Suddenly then, your lungs are filled with vapor and a coughing fit ensues. When inhaling from a vape cart, go low and go slow. This will help you avoid aggressively large hits as well as clogging your hardware. Use the right voltage. Another common mistake people make is selecting the wrong voltage on their battery type, uh, which controls temperature. The majority of 510 thread vape batteries have three settings that indicate the level of power used. Typically, it's blue for low, green for medium, and red for high. Many people assume they should use the highest setting because it creates the biggest clouds of vapor. However, this may actually scorch the oil inside the cart and your throat too. Lower settings allow you to get a more flavorful hit. It brings out the terpenes in your concentrate and prolongs the life of your cartridge. Don't forget to turn your power off if you, uh, if you have that option. Uh, not only will you save power, but you'll also prevent accidentally manipulating the button and frying your oil. I would say 9 out of 10 vapes that you're buying are disposable, which is really unfortunate, too. Back to your packaging issues. Um, I yeah, wish they were refillable. Didn't we just see on the news, too, that, that uh, some kids found a vape cart on the street and picked it up? They were like 5th or 6th graders, yeah, and they smoked yeah. it and got sick? yeah. Don't throw your fucking vape carts on the street, people, please. Yeah. Uh, Avoid extreme temperatures and direct sunlight. Vape carts combine cannabis and electronics, two things that should be kept in cool, dark spaces. Exposure to high heat or super cold temperatures could damage your cartridge and battery. The same goes for the UV light. Store your vape cart and battery at room temperature and out of direct sunlight. Uh, Keep your cart upright. On the subject of storage, keep your cartridge upright. This will ensure the oil doesn't pool on one side, preventing the cartridge from working properly. If it does, you have to wait for the oil to slowly move back to the bottom before you can get a proper hit. Take care of your hardware. In addition to proper storage, make sure your carts and batteries are always in tip-top shape. Residue can build on the mouthpiece of the cart, the bottom thread, or on the battery itself. When this happens, you'll need to clean your hardware. Remove the cartridge from the battery, then dip a cotton swab in isopropyl alcohol and gently wipe away the sticky substance. Do not submerge a cartridge or battery in liquid. This could damage your hardware. Allow everything to air dry completely before reassembling. And while it goes without saying, always keep your battery charged. Nothing is worse than having to wait for a hit. Yeah, do not have your battery plugged in. And you hit that, Ooh. that's bad. Yeah, burn Very it. bad. <laughs> uh, you can use a blow dryer to get every last drop of oil. It's all too common a sight. The oil in your tank gets lower and lower until there are only a few drops left. Oftentimes, the extract will pool on one side, even if the cartridge is kept upright. If that happens, it's possible to get the oil back in place so it doesn't have to go to waste. You should never expose a cartridge or battery to high heat, but using a blow dryer on the lowest setting is acceptable. This will heat the oil enough to get it to move, but it will not damage the hardware or put you in danger. Direct the airflow toward the oil blob, and once it's warm, you can rotate the cartridge to get it where you want it to be. Um, You could consider a refillable vape cartridge system. The vast majority of cartridges on the market are disposable, causing both environmental and budgetary concerns among consumers. Fortunately, it is possible to refill a vape cart if you have the right equipment. Refillable carts have a removable mouthpiece. Once the mouthpiece is off, you can use a syringe to place the oil inside. Pre-filled syringes are available at certain dispensaries, or if you have bulk oil, you can use your own. 
However, it's important to note that not every extra extract will work in a cartridge. The oil needs to be viscous enough to move through the cart's wick system. Uh, vape carts are an easy and discreet way to consume cannabis, but they do require regular maintenance. As long as you do your due diligence, your vaping experience will always be top shelf. There was one thing that article didn't mention. I think uh, that all carts now should they should be moving away from the nickel coils and going to the ceramic, ceramic coils. Yeah. So much better of a smoke, so much cleaner, and nickel tends tends Healthier. to leach. So. And that goes into your lungs. So um, using ceramic does not. It's a little cleaner and safer. So I think that that should be that should be the next phase. We have we have smoked some with with the ceramic coils. Phenomenal, smooth. So um, this is a good article by High Times. Uh, it's, it says ditch the old terminology and indica and sativa response. We've talked about what the genes of the plants are in the past. We've talked about indica sativas hybrids and someone decided to make a nice little chart to make it easier for people that sativas up indicas down hybrids are in the middle somewhere. That is not true. Those are the plant genes, sativa indica hybrid. So, uh, but this article is pretty good. Legendary breeder Todd McCormick weighs in on evolving conversation about the indica sativa. Nah, uh, nomenclature, right? Did I pronounce that right? nomenclature there you go thanks i don't know if that's even right <laughs> that's okay that's all right i've been a student of cannabis since the first time i smoked a joint in 1979 while battling cancer and undergoing uh both chemotherapy and radiation therapy the gracious uh herb was in many ways my savior and it caused me to become dedicated to learning as much as i could about it one of my favorite teachers is robert clark who wrote a book the botany and the ecology of cannabis in 1977 uh, ma marijuana botany in 1981, hashish in 1998, and cannabis evolution and ethnobotany released in 2013. We've been close friends since 1994, and in the 90s, Robert was teaching us that indica and sativa were basically incorrect terminology and that Afghan cannabis should be considered within its own classification. In 2004, and after five long years, I got out of federal prison for growing cannabis after the passing of the 1996 California Medical Marijuana Law. I picked up Rob for the first time in a long time to go to go smoke a joint, and he asked me if I remembered what he taught me about indica sativa and Afghan. I told him that I did remember, and he smiled and he said to forget it because that's what that's not what researchers believe anymore. Our understanding of the plant is changing daily. A science reveals more of life's secrets. It causes us to look at the way we understand things differently. And initially, we used indica sativa in different ways, depending on uh, if you were a grower or a consumer. To cultivate, uh, to a cultivator, indica meant a short, broad leaflet plant that grew tight and stocky, yielded well, and, and finished flowering quickly. Sativa meant that the plant was tropical, equatorial, with narrow leaflets, and took uh, next to forever to finish flowering. To a consumer, indica meant something that was very heavy, high, that was deep, relaxing, and often not so energetic. On the other hand, sativa was translated to mean that it would be more energetics, uh, almost like drinking coffee, in the way that it wakes you up and it motivates you, and more psychedelic, with a buzz that leaves you daydreaming about the universe. To science, it meant something else entirely. When the cannabis uh, taxonomy was uh, first being written in 1753, Carl Linnaeus was essentially aware of the only one type of cannabis— the European hemp variety of cannabis that he added the suffix sativa, which at the time simply meant to grow or to sow. And we've talked about this, I think, in like episode two or three. So, but this is just a good refresher, too. This type of cannabis was used industrially for ropes, cloth, paper, pants, uh, paints, varnishes, but surprisingly, not for consuming. Robert Clark often jokes that, scientifically speaking, nobody smokes sativa because all varieties are indica. In 1785, Jean-Baptiste uh, Jean Lamerick published a description of the second species of cannabis from India, which was used for its content, and he named it Cannabis Indica. Cannabis that was coming from India and many other items that originated from India used the term indica. 
But what was more confusing to our modern use of the term is that there are all types of cannabis growing in India, and leafy morphology does not tell the whole story. In northern India, along the Hindu Kush mountains, oh, Kush, I love you, I mm. love you, Kush, mwah, 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 mwah. you'll wow. find broadleaf drug cannabis, and as you travel south to Goa, you will find very narrow leaflet plants that are all 100% indica. You can also find uh, non-industrial hemp cannabis varieties growing all over the world that have both narrow leaflets and broad leaflets. The flowers look amazing and make copious quantities of trichomes, but they will not get you high. In 2013, Robert Clark, uh, Clark launched a new taxonomy in the world of cannabis. The problem is it is a bit complex. Robert breaks down the varieties as follows. Broad leaflets, BLD. And they, he has drug in there. I refuse to say it. But broad leaflets, so it's BLD. Narrow leaflet, NLD. Broadleaf hemp, BLH. Narrow leaf hemp, NLH. Robert also uh, has another category for ancestors, as there are varieties of cannabis growing around the world that have escaped human cultivation and have become feral once again. I want to go smoke some feral <laughs> cannabis. Feral? Yeah. <laughs> Wild. Wild. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> for this, he uses PA for punitive ancestors. Man, it, it, he's just right. It is confusing. Robert's 21st century cannabis a lot tex of things are confusing. <laughs> taxonomy has been around a for lot. 10 years now. And while it makes a lot of sense, it's not catching on. I think this is mostly because it's too complex for people to grasp these. Like, yeah, scientific people, sure. But every day, nah. But that is to be expected Consider Robert is a scientist. And if you read any of his books, you will see they are very detailed and very well referenced. The modern cannabis market is made up of hybrids, which are incredibly hard to classify as northern or tropical, indica or sativa, because they have attributes of both. The effects we feel when we smoke or, or vaporize are controlled by the cannabinoids and terpenes, which modulate the effects of the cannabinoids. The analogy uh, I would use is that getting high is like getting on an airplane. The cannabinoids bring you up to altitude, and the terpenes are the rudders that control the whole flight. Whoa. That's actually good. That's, see, something like that people understand, mm -hmm. like me. Yeah. The terpenes are so important that the entire experience from the bud can be ruined if the bud is overdried. Because when it's overdried, the terpenes evaporate, and the bud does not taste or smell anywhere near as good as it did when it was fresh. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some terpenes here. There's uh, six different terpene categories, which they call the love language of cannabis. There's more than just these, of course, but these are the ones they're talking about in the article. Myrcene, Mr. Weedman's favorite, favorite terp. This is the most common terpene found in cannabis. Varieties that have it are Skunk One, Northern Lights, Blue Dream, and OG Kush. Uh, Apinine is found in pine needles and is responsible for the piney scent in Northern Lights, number five. Uh, you can actually go to the forest and go walk around and smell some pine trees, and you're going to smell A and B piney. Uh, limeline is found in lemons or lemon pledge and other citrus fruit and gives wonderfully uplifting energy that can also be quite medicinal with anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties. Varieties that smell like a lemon dessert usually have high amounts of limeline, such as wedding cake and mac. Be carefuline is found in black pepper and cloves and adds a spicy, Herbal note to cannabis. Varieties that have it are cookies, sherbet, and UK cheese. Uh, terpaline is uh, this author, writer of this article's favorite. It is the dominant terpene responsible for the spicy smell and haze. It is energetic and motivating. And I've been smoking, uh, this writer's been smoking it uh, for a long time. You will find it in original haze, train wreck, Jack Carrera, and Super 11 haze. Asamine is one of the exotics. It's often found in cannabis, but in lower quantities and is more of the complementary than rather a dominant terpene. Varieties that have it are pineapple, uh, dream queen, and pink lemonade. As a grower, breeder, and heavy user who has been selling seeds for years through, uh, through, this co through his company, I recommend to all the cultiv cultivars, uh, cultivators who grow my seeds that they stop selecting plants based upon high THC levels. Fast flowering times and heavy yield. Unfortunately, for the past 30 plus years, cannabis varieties have been selected and hybridized for the convenience of the grower and not for the overall quality of the end user. When I recommend it is that 
you start growing and selecting plants based on olfactory qualities. What do I always say? How do I taste? Through your olfactory gland, through your nose. That's how I have terrible taste buds. I taste through my nose. Um, such as flavor and scent. Don't get mad at me. I'm not getting mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> if food does not taste or smell good, no matter how nutritious it is, you're probably not going to want to eat it, and it's the same true for cannabis. Too many varieties of cannabis in the commercial market look great, but don't do the trick for many of, of people who smoke it. As for effect, there is a cultivation technique that this breeder's been using and teaching people, which is that you can dial the high of cannabis variety by simply harvesting it at different times. Varieties that are harvested early will have a lighter or more psychedelic high compared to the same variety harvested later into maturity, which will have a more sedated and relaxing high. Uh, this is writer uh, thinks that uh, you should ditch the old terminology and instead get a better understanding of what it is that you are consuming and what elements of cannabis make uh, make us all feel the way we want to feel when we smoke it, vape it, vaporize it, or eat tincture, bombs, or your favorite flowers. Find them out. And if you have any questions about genetics, uh, listen to The Grow Hour. It's our other podcast that we do with Big Earl. And go go talk to Earl217 uh, on Instagram. He's amazing at what he does, and he knows his stuff. But also people we've had on the show too, like Terp Fiend, uh, Straight A Genetics, Mike from Straight A Genetics. Um, there's, the list goes on and on and on. I, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, Tricomb Jungle, Hummingbird Hills, uh, uh, there's just uh, Deep Roots, Rachel from Deep Roots. There's so many people we've, we've had on the show. Uh, Magic Beans, Nick from Magic Beans. Talk to them. Ask them. when you, They all sell seeds. Ask them what you're looking for. If they, they are all excellent breeders and they know their shit and they can help you find what you're looking for in the strains that they sell. So take a look at the Grow Hour. Take a listen to the Grow Hour and find out who we've had on and, and go talk to them. And they're all – if they stand by their product and they're professional breeders, they're going to help you because they want your business and they want to work with you and they want you to come back. So that's it. That's all I got to say about that, Mrs. Wee, man. That's it. Edibles. More about edibles. Yeah. We love them. How long do they fucking last, though? That's the question because I wake up every morning because we take our edible late now. We've been taking our edible about 10, 30, 11 o'clock, mm -hmm. and it finally hits, you know, but I still feel the residual effects when I wake up, usually till about noon, which I don't mind, but I'm kind of slow in the morning because we take, we take nighttime edibles. You know, we don't take daytime edibles. So when I wake up in the morning, I'm just like, I'm moseying my day till about like mm -hmm. noon, you know, <laughs> I'm like, I'm just all calm, cool, and collective because it, it, it stays in there for a while. So how long do edibles last? Well, edible cannabis con edible cannabis continues to evolve, offering new flavors and product types to attract customers from every demographic. Buying the right edible for yourself at the dispensary takes a specific skill set, but there is more to ingesting cannabis than picking out the perfect product. Many consumers aren't sure of the dosage they need or how long it'll take to kick in. Some also wonder how long edibles will last. From storing edible products to understanding the life cycle of events, the process has nuances, which can feel overwhelming for newcomers. This guide to cannabis edibles will make a beginner feel more than ready to crack open that infused treat with the comfort of knowing what precautions to take to avoid overconsumption. So, finding your right dose. Edible effects present differently in every person. Some need only 2 milligrams to reach their ideal experience, while others prefer 10 milligrams or more. This range speaks to an individual's tolerance and metabolism and shows the importance of understanding your dose before consuming. As a bud tender, I advise people to start with 2.5 milligrams at a time and wait up to 2 hours before consuming more. I chose this amount because edibles often come in 10 or 5 milligram packages, so it's easy to get a 2.5 milligram dose when cutting pieces. Uh, your preferred dose may vary slightly between different products, like a drink or a brownie. Um, so always start slow when trying a new type of edible. And that's key, a new type even. Not even just trying edibles, period, but maybe you've always had gummies or maybe you've always had baked goods. So now you're going to do a tincture. Well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen really differently. Yeah, we took that so, tincture... Sunday night, and it hit pretty quick. It hits. It like, faded yeah. quick, but it hit quick. Yeah, it processes through you quickly, but it, yeah, you feel it like maybe five minutes. Yeah. Kind of like smoking a joint. 
It's pretty instantaneous. Uh, storage systems. Store most edibles in a cool, dark place as can cannabinoids degrade with light and heat. Additionally, follow the storage rules for the type of edible purchased. For example, some baked goods will dry out in the refrigerator, but you should always refrigerate a dairy-based product. Uh, so follow guidelines to store your edibles properly, and it's also essential to keep products out of little hands. Uh, when will the edible kick in? A myriad of factors are That's at play. That's the mystery of life right there, everybody. Mm -hmm. When will it kick in? Yep. <laughs> when evaluating how long it takes to feel the effects of an infused product, a person's metabolism, what they ate that day, and liver function can all play a role in how long an edible takes to kick in. According to a naturopath who spoke at a medical dispensary where I worked, edibles effects can start anywhere from 15 minutes to two hours after ingestion. Well, think about it. Like, think about even alcohol consumption. I mean, you're not instantly drunk. You're going to sit there for a couple hours. It usually takes people a couple hours to get drunk if they're, like, getting serious about it. I know some people that would do, like, five shots. They could shots, do five shots. And they right. would be pretty and that'd be the person right who ate. That would be the person who eats a cookie for the first time. Right. Like, a whole cookie the first time. Yep. So... It's interesting because it, in some ways it is kind of like that and it kind of builds on itself. So the more like if you keep eating and keep eating, it's going to kick in at different times. But then at some point, it's going to have this compounded effect of just feeling way too high. So um, products peak four hours after ingestion. So waiting two hours before consuming another dose is crucial. Consuming more before the effects kick in could lead to an escalated high for up to eight hours. Which you're not gonna like if you're. Yeah, not you gotta realize it. that edibles just because you process. start feeling it doesn't mean you're feeling it yet. Mm -hmm. it, you there's a there's a like peak. a wave. There, there's a mm -hmm. peak where you all of a sudden you're feeling the, the wave of it coming, and all of a sudden you're like, "Whoa, I'm really good." And then you start coming down a little bit because your body is processing it. You right. might pee a couple times. You might do some things. So you're, you're coming down a little bit, and you're, that that peakness is what what gets some people. Mm -hmm. They're like, "I it's die, too much. Oh my god, yeah. I'm gonna die." But it's like. Not a long window. You no. just have to ride it out. All right. So uh, consuming more before your effects kick in can lead to an escalated high for up to eight hours. For many, this would be uncomfortable. Be mindful of this window of time. If necessary, set a timer while you're figuring out your dosage of a new product. Uh, the science of the matter. Methods of administration can play a role in the weight as well. When eating cannabis, Delta 9 THC goes through the digestive system and the liver, a process that converts the familiar cannabinoid to 11-hydroxy-THC. Many bud tenders suggest taking tinctures, glycerin extracts, and other liquid products under your tongue or sublingually. It provides the fastest onset. A 1985 study for the American Journal of Cardiology investigated the bioavailability of sublingual nitroglycerin. For the study, 16 healthy male volunteers were given 25 picograms per milliliter of nitroglycerin. In the study, effects took 10 minutes, one of many instances where sublingual administration led to higher bioavailability and a faster onset of effects. Technology is the final factor that may influence how long it takes an edible to kick in. Nanoemulsion, for example, is the process of suspending a liquid in another liquid to get a stable end product. In cannabis, this process creates a uniform infused ingredient that companies sell to manufacturers to make gummies, drinks, and other edibles. Nano emulsions claim to be reliably dosed and stable with a quick onset of effects of around 15 to 20 minutes. With the variances between how long it might take to feel the effects of an edible, Always ask the bud tender if they've tried the product. Get the inside scoop at the counter. The product could be made with a nano emulsion or take a few hours to get going. And the bud tender probably has the details. So how long do they last? Bum, bum, bum. An educational pamphlet from the Canadian Center on Substance Use and Addiction claims an edible can last anywhere from 12 to 24 hours, which I can corroborate based on personal experience. When I eat an edible to go to sleep, I wake up with what I call a weed hangover. But this could just be lingering effects. Whether it's a weed hangover or a 24-hour edible, be mindful of whether you're still feeling it before operating heavy machinery or doing any other possibly dangerous activities. 
Many of us want to explore the bounty of edible products on dispensary shelves, but you've got to know the basics of cannabis edibles before jumping in. Knowing your dose and understanding the life cycle of effects is an excellent way to avoid overconsumption. After all, a reliable edible experience is often an enjoyable one. I love edibles, but yes, yeah. be careful, you know, but uh, it's always I love talking about them because it's such a uh, a lot of people do them, you mm-hmm. know, and the more information we can give about edibles. So, yes, we do talk about them a lot. <laughs> Record numbers of U.S. workers test positive for cannabis. An annual analysis, uh, analysis from Quest Diagnostics Medical Lab and testing company shows that percentage of general U.S. employees who tested positive for cannabis in 2022 reached the highest level ever recorded by Quest, which began analyzing annual workplace uh, drug testing data since 1988. Of the more than 6 million urine tests Quest analyzed in 2022 for cannabis use in the general work category, which excludes federally mandated safety-sensitive workers such as pilots, truck drivers who undergo routine drug testing, 4.3% were positive, up from 3.9% in 2021. This marks the highest number of positive test results for uh, marijuana ever recorded by Quest during the 34 years as analyzed workplace drug use data. The number of general workers who tested positive for uh, marijuana following a, an on-the-job accident in 2022 was 7.3% compared to, with 6.7% in 2021, the highest level in 25 years. Be careful on the job when you're using cannabis, all right? Don't be foolish. Yeah. Uh, the New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission approved 106 New Jersey cannabis licenses and discussed the opening of a limited portal for the more licensed types. Good for you, Jersey. The place I was born. Food, drink, pot under one roof. California state bill could allow for cannabis cafes with food and drink, which we heard them talk about at NECAN the other day. You can have a cannabis consumption lounge, but you can't serve food and drink. Mm-hmm. That makes no sense. I know, right? It's no sense whatsoever. <laughs> how do you, you know, if you so just how have do you how do you produce income. any sort of income? Right, because you can't sell weed either. Right. South yeah. Dakota surpasses ten thousand medical cannabis cards. Good for you, South Dakota. SD. Uh, Congress tackles medical cannabis for veterans. GOP-led bill will open doors to research. The Veterans Cannabis Analysis, Research, and Effectiveness, CARE Act, was introduced, and uh, the news follows a recent survey by the Universities of North Texas and Illinois revealing that 1 in 10 veterans reported past-year cannabis use. The research analyzed cannabis trends among a representative groups of over 16,000 veterans from 2013 to 2019. PTSD is a real thing, and cannabis has been proven to help PTSD. And a lot of people and a lot of veterans that come back from something they've seen in, in a war or fighting or it, just in anything come back with PTSD and cannabis is proved to help them. It should be, it shouldn't even be like a thought to be helping our veterans in anything home homelessness for our veterans is huge in this country. They should be able to get places to live. They should be able to get cannabis to help them with their PTSD. It should be free. They served, they protected, they went out there and gave their, their lives up for us. Whether you agree with it or not, it's not, it's what they were taking orders, okay? So they went in the military to serve this country. They deserve things to help them through life. Florida recreational cannabis effort clears crucial hurdle. They got the uh, signatures above 70,000 above the requirement to reach the ballot. Smart and safe through April had spent $38.4 million to get the new measure on the ballot. All paid for by medical marijuana giant True Leave Inc. Of course, a big corporate cannabis wants cannabis to go legal. They own a bazillion fucking dispensaries in Florida. But the point is that they went out and got the votes that are going to go on the ballot. So Florida, don't fuck it up this time. Don't miss it out by 2% like you did last time. Online cannabis shopping now a reality in Colorado after governor's approval. Good for you. Wisconsin is now surrounded by states that have can't legal cannabis. And everyone's making funny memes about <laughs> Wisconsin not like being a- surrounded. Uh, it was funny. It was a meme that had uh, two girls fighting. It says, I own Wisconsin. And it has a kid smoking a bowl. The rest of the Midwest. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh <laughs> So there was one, you know that one meme where the guy 
and his girlfriend are walking. He turns his head, and there's a pretty girl, and there's always like a funny caption. Right, right. So there's new Glarus over the girl. Mm -hmm. The guy's looking back, and it's a butt of weed. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Wisconsin, you got legal weed? It'd be a lot cooler if you did. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Wisconsin, it's Squidward looking out at Patrick and and um, and SpongeBob dancing with a joint in their hand, going Illinois, Michigan, and Minnesota. <laughs> 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 so there's some good ones. Uh, California Assembly approves bill to legalize cannabis cafes. Man, I'm so super stoked about this. I, I got to go back to it because I think every state should be doing this. What state is it? Uh, California again. I'm just again. mentioning it again because I think it's just fucking awesome. You know that they're doing this, and and every state should be allowed to do this, and it shouldn't just be ten places and all the same people owning it it mm -hmm. should just be like a regular bar, a person that wants to open a restaurant wants to open up a bar be able to serve cannabis and and don't who cares if they serve alcohol maybe beer or wine but if you don't allow that then don't but let them serve food and snacks let them have live music and and karaoke if that's what you like and trivia nights let them do the same thing it's a safe haven listen listen if you're worried about people getting into car accidents because they're stoned let me tell you something there is more deaths due to alcohol, and you have not put a kibosh in alcohol in this country at all. Sure. So don't don't let this happen in all states. It shouldn't even be a, a, a an issue. Missouri, hundred million pot revenue, huge. Uh, medical cannabis goes digital. Rhode Island implements paperless card registration system. Uh, New Jersey uh, is just killing it with uh, some new licenses. And uh, new cultivation. Uh, Missouri's raking in $100 million from cannabis sales last month. Crazy. Uh, Ocean City, Maryland prepares for recreational cannabis and a ban uh, on on site consumption. Boo. 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 Come on, Marilyn. Mm -hmm. I want to eat some blue crabs at a restaurant, and smoke a joint. Let's go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. I used to be a fan of Kelly Ripa until I just read this article. I'm oh, just come kidding. on. I'm just kidding. Be nice. <laughs> be nice. Let's talk about Kelly Ripa, will yeah. you? Well, she's complaining that her New York City neighborhood smells like marijuana by 8 a.m. So dramatic. Come to our house. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly Ripa and Mark Consuelos are over the early morning marijuana stench in their New York City neighborhood. During a recent morning's episode of Live with Kelly and Mark, the married couple delivered a PSA to those striking up at their Upper East Side block first thing in the morning. The conversation was sparked while the duo was speaking of the smells of New York when it starts to get hot in the city before reflecting upon their time living in Soho when Ripple was pregnant with their three children. When you're early in pregnancy, you can develop aversions to smell, she told the audience, to which Consuela said, yeah, you had an aversion to me. Ripa continued, the smell of Mark used to make me very sick, and I love the way he smells. The smell of Mark is one of my favorite things, unless I'm pregnant, and then I'm like, please get away from me. Apparently, the only thing worse was the smell of their former neighborhood. Ripa went on to reveal that she would gag the moment she stepped outside in downtown Manhattan, where Consuelos joked that you'd get a nice stew of whatever happened the night before. Having paid their dues in smelly Soho, he described where they live now, the Upper East Side, as a much more civilized area. Oh, they're fancy. Uh, it's fancy. So fancy. Um, although that doesn't necessarily mean that it's completely free of its own smells either. It just smells like marijuana. Everyone is smoking pot everywhere, Ripa said, before Consuelos added, It's 8 o'clock in the morning. What are you doing? Ripa then started, stared into the camera, asking her fellow neighbors, Guys, guys, why are you high already? And I'm not an ageist, but you're my mom's age. Can you get baked later on? While it sounds like she's not much of a stoner these days, at least we'll always have Ripa's iconic Broad City cameo where she lights up and gets baked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. If you're having a cup of coffee in the morning, yeah. Some people like to have a joint in the morning. Yeah, like when I'm when I'm her mom's age, which is probably like what they're our age. They're like 50. So her mom's in her 70s at least, right? Well, frick yeah. If she wants to have a joint with her yeah, coffee, yeah. get to it. Yep, absolutely. International news. Spain's long-delayed medical cannabis regulation imminent despite election worries. Amsterdam Red Light District smoking ban transforms public places. 
Lithuania approves national agenda, singles cannabis decriminalization. Luxembourg unveils bold cannabis legalization pilot project. Thailand's marijuana reversal, a shift in legalization stance. Thailand's incoming coalition government led by Move Forward Party plans to reverse the country's marijuana legalization efforts. Boo. I told you a long time ago, Thailand, don't fuck it up. And now this new government's going to come in and possibly fuck it up. Once the new government takes office, marijuana will be relisted as a narcotic, allowing for stricter, stricter control, according to Dr. Weho. I can't pronounce the last name. I'm not even going to try. Uh, a member of Move Forward's public health working panel. However, the party intends to issue regulations to protect existing marijuana-related businesses as they adapt to the changing landscape. The move marks as a shift from the previous uh, party's efforts to legalize marijuana, which led to its removal from the narcotics list in 2019. The new government aims to pass laws governing the remaining 30% of marijuana shops and stalls while eliminating about 70% of the existing businesses, as reported by Thai PBS World. Boo! Uh, <laughs> just put some standardization in it. Don't put it back on the narcotic list. Just make some new laws to standardize it and keep it clean. Don't change shit. Man, your tourism is huge. People love it there. They grow phenomenal weed. Come on now. Competition Bureau's recommendations shake up Canada's cannabis industry. German religion government isn't on board with national marijuana uh, legalization plan. Ugh, come on now. Man, we've been talking about Germany for a long time. Local government in India bans cannabis use at Lord Shiva shrines in Odisha. Okay, I get it. Uh, State Department says more countries are embracing religious marijuana use in 20, uh, back in 2022. Police to regulate cannabis usage in Thailand, cultivators under protection following election. This is more news about Thailand. Could Iceland be the next country to legalize medical cannabis? I hope so. Let's go, Iceland. Uh, Bjork would love to have cannabis legalized in Iceland. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cannabis stores in British Columbia can now have transparent windows. Good for you, British Columbia. About time. Antigua and Barbuda grant Rastafari right to grow sacramental marijuana. Uh, on the same ground where their enslaved ancestors were forced to plant sugarcane, Rastafari on, on this small island nation are now legally growing and ritualized, uh, ritualistically smoking cannabis. For Rastafari, the practice begins them closer to the divine, but for decades, many of them been jailed and endured ra uh, racial and religious profiling by law enforcement because of their marijuana use. The government of Antigua and Barbuda has sought the right to right the wrong. The Twin Islands recently became one of the first Caribbean nations to grant Rastafari authorization to grow and smoke their sacramental herb. This is great. This is amazing because Mrs. Weeman right now is going to talk about why Rastafari smoke cannabis for sacramental reasons and the faith's others' beliefs. Yeah. Okay. Whew. I'm out of breath and I'm not even talking. You smoked that joint like three more times while I was talking. Yeah, but I'm so I'm so congested. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay though. Here we go. This is this is why Rastafaris, which is actually a religion, smoke weed for sacramental reasons and the faith's other beliefs. Members of the Rastafari religion and political movement have for decades been persecuted and imprisoned for the ritualistic use of cannabis. However, the tiny islands of Antigua and Barbuda recently became one of the first Caribbean nations to grant Rastafari official sacramental authorization to grow and smoke the herb that they deem sacred. Antigua and Barbuda Prime Minister Gaston Brown told the Associated Press in an interview that his government took this step to try to end the persecution and bring respect to the Rastafari faith. Rastafari elsewhere are pushing for similar religious protections. Experts and stakeholders think the Antigua and Barbuda law could give a boost to these efforts worldwide at a time when public opinion and policy are continuing to shift in the favor of medical and recreational cannabis use. Here's a quick look at the faith's beliefs and history. Water, water. <laughs> mm. Okay, origins. The Rastafari faith is rooted in 1930s Jamaica, growing as a response by black people to white colonial oppression. The beliefs are a melding of Old Testament teachings and a desire to return to Africa. 
Its message was spread across the world in the 1970s by Jamaican music icons Bob Marley and Peter Tosh. Oof, they were so great. Two of the faith's most famous exponents. A Rastafari's personal relationship with Jah, or God, is considered central to the faith. Sacramental cannabis. Rastafari followers believe the use of marijuana is directed in biblical passages and that the holy herb induces a meditative state and brings them closer to the divine. The faithful smoke is at, at the faithful smoke it as a sacrament in chalice pipes or cigarettes called spliffs. Add it to plant-based organic stews and place it in fires as a burnt offering. But adherents, many of them black, have endured both racial and religious profiling due to their ritualistic use of cannabis. Ganja. Ganja, as marijuana is known in the Caribbean, has a long history in Jamaica, and its arrival predates the Rastafari faith. Indentured servants from India brought the cannabis plant to the island in the 19th century, and it gained popularity as a medicinal herb. Hail Sal Salasi. Most of its many sects worship the late Ethiopian emperor Hale Selassie. This is rooted in Jamaican black nationalist leader Marcus Garvey's 1920s prediction that a black king shall be crowned in Africa, ushering in a day of deliverance. When an Ethiopian prince named Ras Tafari, who took the name Hale Selassie, won, became emperor in 1930, the descendants of slaves in Jamaica took it as proof that Garvey's prophecy was being fulfilled. While Hale Selassie visited Jamaica in 1966, he was greeted by adorning crowds, and some Rastafari insisted miracles and other mystical occurrences took place during his visit to the island. And that's the end. I thought there was more. No, that was the that's end. That's so cool, though. It's so I cool. didn't really know the, the background to that. Yeah, I, I mean, I've watched some shows about Rastafari, and... Uh, some of it but this was like taught me even more and i think it's great for the culture of cannabis and for us to understand more where and the indian the indian influence into yeah. it because it's it, it seems a lot like hindu um like a very peaceful religion yes. and, and i like that they believe in the old testament mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they attribute cannabis to help bring them closer to the divine and, and yeah, they'll be able neat. to yeah it's amazing i mean it's awesome i cannot wait to one day go to jamaica and, and just be able to, to learn more um Vic Menza of 93 Boys launches, this is really cool, by the way, NPO Books Before Bars, bringing literature and liberation to Illinois prisons. The new partnership aims to provide inmates with potentially transform transformative resources. Vic Menza is a man for the people. Not only did he launch Chicago's first black-owned weed brand, 93 Boys, but Menza used funds from 93 Boys to fill the gas tanks of over 200 cars at a gas station in the south oh, side of yeah, Chicago. Yeah. Remember that? Yep. It looks like the Chicago hailing uh, rapper isn't done yet. 93 Boys recently announced the launch of a nonprofit organization called Books Before Bars, dedicated to providing undeserved prisons, uh, prisons and inmates with books. Phenomenal. That's great. Vic Menz's pioneering cannabis brand, 93 Boys, has taken a giant step towards empowering incarcerated individuals. The books provide provided are meant to offer inmates a pathway to personal growth through transform transformative resources that they didn't have access to before. Bef books before bars was launched to address the lack of access to literature in prison libraries. The organization's mission is to provide inmates with a comprehensive selection of influential books that inspire personal development, critical thinking, and inner liberation. That's the one thing about when you come, when people come out of prison, they weren't trained to get out of that old mindset that they have. Yeah. So this kind of books that they're giving them will help. Hopefully, will help prisoners better themselves. So when they come out of prison they can ex excel and succeed and do something better with their lives instead of ending back into the system. Books Before Bars hopes that inmates will find the value and liberation with these books, potentially embarking on a journey of self-discovery throughout incarceration. Uh, some, of the, some of the books that are, are here are listed, The New Jim Crow, The Autobiography of Malcolm X, A New Earth, The Power of Now, Black Skin, White Mask, Revolutionary Suicide. The list goes on. In order to make this a reality, Books Before Bars are receiving funds from Vic, Vic Menz's pioneering cannabis brand, 93 Boys. While Books Before Bars is the latest philo, uh, philotropic move from Vic Menza, it's not the first. 
Menza also launched Save Money, Save Life in a partnership with 93 Boys, which is a Chicago-based native and black-led nonprofit organization rallying for sustainable changes like prison reform and equity in cannabis. Furthermore, 93 Boys has also partnered with the largest aeroponic cannabis cultivator worldwide. I do enjoy this company's cannabis here. It's one of the ones I smoke at when I when I need some cannabis from a dispensary, which is never, but when I do, or a, a good friend of mine that works for them gives me some nugs to try. Arise, uh, specializing in sustainable and eco-friendly uh, processes. It's clear that the heart of 93 Boys is a mission to transform lives and opportunities by reinvesting in communities that have been disproportionately uh, affected for far too long. Now, 93 Boys is reinvesting resources in Illinois prisons to ensure everyone has a chance to win. Uh, Menza stated in a press release, the goal of the book's before bars is to bring liberation and freedom to people who are incarcerated through literature because he believes strongly that when you change your inner reality, you begin to influence your external reality. Good job, Vic Menza, Chicago native, uh, hip hop artist, rapper, first cannabis brand, black owned cannabis brand here in Illinois. Good for you and good for giving back, especially to people that really, truly need it, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so it's awesome. It's good. It's good to see, to read stories like this and, and to see what people are doing, not only just taking their money and running, but taking their money and reinvesting it into helping people. That's what it's all about. Um, Mrs. Weed Man. Mr. Weed Man. This is the end of the show. Yeah. End of the show. It's the end of the show. We'll have more good stories next week. <laughs> <laughs> you got anything else to say? Um, yeah, I'm ready to fire that joint back up. You are crushing that I'm crushing joint. it. I'm crushing it, man. <laughs> Just freaking crushing it. <laughs> crushing that J. That's right. <laughs> got a problem with it? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, that's I, good. I just, you. That's good. You keep on going, girl. That's right. You got it. <laughs> you do you. Hey, it is Pride Month. It is Pride Month. Happy Pride Month. Happy Pride Month, everybody. To all of you. Yep. Ooh, however you identify, be strong, be proud of it, and do your thing. Just be you. Just be you. Just, like you said, just be you. Just be and you. And don't let anyone ever change your mind. That's right. Right? Live your life to the fullest. Live People your life to the best. People have been hiding behind what they really are for years and years and years. So the last handful of years has flipped the script a bit and shook the world up a little bit. And there's some realities that are hard for some people to face. But when it comes down to it, you be you and be proud and just fucking do it. And That's all. Love everybody out there. Love everybody. That's it. Be kind. It's yeah, pretty easy. That's what I always say. Be kind to everybody. So Mrs. Wee Man throwing out the nice one at the end there. Yeah. I love it. Thanks, hey. Mrs. Wee Man. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling like very dry right now. <laughs> all of a sudden, I just hit this very like... Mm. Mode. And you need to smoke more? <laughs> I got to smoke more. There you go. Hey, everybody out there in the world, thanks for listening. We love you out there. We appreciate everybody DMing us. And uh, get back to, like, uh, I need to get some people back on my Instagram. So follow me at uh, WeMet420Chronicles2.0, please. I miss all the people out there that were on my old one. A lot of people haven't followed me back yet. Please, please come back and start DMing me. I, I miss all the conversations. I miss all the laughs and all the shit everybody sends me. So please do. And uh, we love you out there. As Paulie always says, smoke smart. Puff, puff, and away. Puff, puff, pass. Check out our cannabis lifestyle brand online at 8decades.com. Our custom smokes and accessories are perfect for your coffee table, bedroom nightstand, or kitchen counter. They're designed for you to show them off. The Canna community is also loving our hemp and cotton blend t-shirts, sweatshirts, scarves, and hats finished off with our 8 Decades logo. We've got some awesome long-lasting goods that will be your favorite for years to come. 8 Decades, because a ninth decade of cannabis prohibition isn't acceptable.